Okay. So uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'm hoping that everybody can see the deck that's up there. I just got a head nod from somebody. You see what's going on there? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so uh, deep dive into the future of education. This is a, uh, a month long project that we've been working on here. I should say the students have been working on. I haven't really. It's the start of a year long discussion uh, about the future of what we need to do to prepare for the future. I would even argue that it's about using the future to help us prepare for right now. Um, but I, for the video's purpose, at least, I know everybody here, but uh, my name is Dave Cormier. I work in the Office of Open Learning at the University of Windsor. And uh, I've had the great pleasure of having a number of co-op students work with me during the pandemic, and it has kind of started this project. Um, we've had uh, 70 co-op students, um, and it's really brought home this whole idea of uncertainty. So we're gonna, I'm going to do a brief introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about co-op students and, and the experience we've had here in the office. To talk about why I think uncertainty is, is a really important part of this process. And then the students will go ahead and do the, the work that they've done with futures and the, their impression of this. Um, so starting off, we had 70 co-op students in the office since the start of the pandemic. So these are students from engineering and business and computer science and kinesiology who were supposed to be doing um, uh, work inside of their own fields and of course with the pandemic a lot of those placements became much much harder to do and so uh, we reached out and offered some positions inside of our office and had a whole whale of a time working together on a variety of projects we did um, a lot of student preparation work so helping students get ready to to learn online we ran some projects some vls projects a virtual learning strategy projects from the province of ontario these students did a lot of collaborative work um, we did a lot of um, a lot of deep thinking, really, about the place of the student inside of our um, inside of our universities. What kind of skills were important? What kinds of things they were learning, and how that related to what it was like to actually work in our office. And that question about skills about things people need is is out there all over the place this is from a recent conversation i was uh, i was at a talk in, in vancouver a couple of weeks ago and just walking down the street everywhere is this conversation about the skill 21st century skills and learning for a complex future and this is two of like five posters in one block uh, from bcit uh, the british columbia institute of technology but go past any institution in any part of the world and somewhere somehow you're going to see something about the 21st century and how we're preparing students. And so obviously people are talking about it. Some people are talking about it in good ways and some people are talking about it in ways that, um, well, th that aren't as maybe thought out, that are less about having a broad discussion with a lot of people and more about sort of fantasizing or fetishizing the future. Uh, this is a blog post by the excellent Ben Doxator that traces the history of the job, future jobs that don't exist, future jobs that don't currently exist, right? So this, uh, his blog post is fantastic, but you know, there's the classic Carl Fish video from uh, 15 years ago that claims that two thirds of the jobs that students are gonna be doing in 15 years don't currently exist. Um, and of course, it's 15 years later, uh, there are not two thirds of the jobs we're doing now don't like, those haven't materialized, that kind of change hasn't happened. And that's certainly when we talk about future, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about some kind of speculative, like Jetsons, sorry for the reference, old people reference, but some kind of, where is my flying car exactly? Some kind of Jetsons future that um, we're uh, predicting in that sense. That has nothing to do with what we're doing here. What we're rather doing is looking at trends and trying to see what the things that are happening now could mean and how we could get ready for some of those things. Um, because that future, when you look at it, does look a little bit uncertain, right? It doesn't look like um, a pat sense, like a design process that's gonna find a solvable answer to some of these problems. When you look at the problems that students in school now are gonna be facing, so undergraduate students who are like 20, there's not lots of students are, uh, are older than that and come in different ways. When you look at that future out 15, 20, 25 years, you know, people being able to buy a house, state of the climate at that, at that time, I can't see the oil stuff that's happening now getting better, whatever that would mean. 
you know, we've got a war in Europe. We've got a lot of that kind of big uncertainty. But at that same conference I was talking about in Vancouver, I asked um, the audience members to talk about the other kinds of uncertainty that they saw in front of them. And there's a lot of them, right? Um, there are a lot of issues out there that don't have simple, solvable answers. When I say uncertainty, I don't mean there's an answer and we don't know that answer currently. I mean things that that you can't solve for. You know, we can't solve for the climate. There's not like, there's not, I don't have an answer in my back pocket somewhere that I can pull out and go, oh, this is the right answer. This is what we should be doing. It's a complex situation, it requires a lot of different kinds of work. And this is the, the quote that started this whole project, right? I had one student who came up to me, uh, I think it was two weeks into the term, and he looked at me and, and started apologizing. And I'm like, I don't, I say looked at me, we we're online in this kind of uh, venue. And he said, look, I'm sorry, um, you've been asking for my opinion for two weeks now, and I thought you were lying the whole time because I've never had an adult ask me a question when they didn't already know what answer they wanted or they didn't already know the answer themselves, right? And that isn't a, that in no way is meant to slight the student who asked that question because that student can tell the difference. But the relationship that they've been in with the people who teach them their, their whole life was one where somebody had a secret private answer they were holding back and they'd ask them a question to test them to see if they could get that answer. And it leads to this really weird kind of situation where, um, where students think that, well, where they've been trained to believe that every question has an answer. Right? When we look out to this uncertain future, this is no preparation at all. Right? When we're looking at all of these uncertain challenges, all these things we need to deal with, all and the students will walk you through like an example of what that looks like. But having a right answer is not something they're going to have for the challenges that they're facing for a lot of those challenges. And it speaks to the skills that we care about, right? And I'm not saying that knowing things or having a memory of something is a bad idea or that somehow you don't need to know the definitions to things, though on, on certain days I might make that claim. Um, I'm saying that our system right now, as it stands, multiple choice questions, the way that we set out to cover the content is something I've heard over and over and over again over the pandemic when people were moving their stuff online. How am I gonna make sure I cover that content? That content focus leaves a whole slew of skills um, that I would say are necessary for confronting uncertainty that aren't being dealt with. You know, Gene Glasser talk about it as classroom style questions, questions where there's a question, there's a clean process that, every, that the instructor knows and there's an answer that the instructor knows versus a real world question, which is one where, um, a real world question, which is one where we have either the question or the answer or the process is something that is not only unknown to me, it's, not, it's unknown to everybody. Go to the next slide, please, Patrick. Those things are uncertain. And I mean, if you look at the stuff from, uh, from Riddle and Weber from the 70s, it, they're wicked problems, right? They're problems that don't have answers. And the only problem I have with the word wicked instead of uncertainty is it makes it sound dramatic. And I'm not talking about just dramatic problems. So many of the problems we deal with are uncertain. And so this journey that we're on right now, so this is the first conversation of many, I would try to make it, oh, I'm at about 10 minutes, that's okay. Uh, it's the first conversation of many. I wanted to start with a conversation that was led by students um, in their own journey through this process to sort of ask ourselves the questions of what skills do we need uh, to confront uncertainty? What ways do we need to think about the way that we're engaging in the process of learning to help people prepare themselves for that kind of uncertain future? That Future Challenges Institute, that's FCI, uh, we're looking at February right now, but we'll have a series of talks going through until then. So uh, the next one's on June 15th, and then it'll be every month after that. And then we're hoping to do an open course, maybe even the M word, a MOOC uh, in the fall, um, doing uh, sort of group futures work then to starting to dig into this question. So there's my introduction, folks. Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, listening to uh, our conversation here. Sticky questions. Yeah, Kevin is another great way of putting it. 
Um, and uh, I'm going to turn this over to the students. Uh, Patrick's going to start us off and they'll carry us through the work they've been doing. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Patrick Carnavali, and I'm a third year computer science student at the University of Windsor. I've worked for Dave Cormier for about a year now at the Office of Open Learning, uh, and it's been fun. Um, but today I'm going to talk about the future. So what did we do and why are we here? My fellow, uh, <laughs> my fellow students and fellow coworkers and I were asked to do a speculative deep dive into what the future of students and education might look like as well as highlight the possible challenges and the skills needed to overcome those challenges in those futures. So one of the ways that we determined what these futures would look like or imagined what these futures would look like is we looked at current day trends. So as you can see with the chart on the left, you can see from 2005 to 2013, uh, the trends of smartphones and PCs went up. I'm sure if the, tr if the chart went up to 2022, it would be way higher, but that's what I mean by when I say trends. And on the right, you can see an image of a whole bunch of different kinds of trends in today's society. These are SHRC trends, and SHRC uh, stands for Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. That's where we got these. So we were asked by Dave to pick some of these futures and some of these or some of these trends and identify a future from them and try and imagine what that future might look like for education. So these are the four trends that we ended up picking. There are three students at the Office of Open Learning. So we each got one of these trends and then we did a joint trend to get four futures. So the emerging asocial society talks about how this younger generation is becoming more detached from society, like in a physical presence and more in a digital presence. Um, the inhabiting challenging environments kind of ties into climate change and global warming and the future earth that we're going to have to live with. Uh, the evolving bio age kind of ties into humanity plus as well um, with things like Neuralink from Elon Musk and kind of upgrades to our genetic code that we can make. And then the last one is envisioning governance systems that work, which we will talk about the future uh, in a second. So we imagined these futures and as you can imagine, they got very sci-fi esque. So none of them are really realistic. And it's worth mentioning that none of these futures are neither good nor bad. They're just what we think could come to pass if current trends keep going the way that they do. Um, so our first future is the climate change future. This was the one that we all worked on together and yes, obviously it's bad for the environment and for our home, but one of the reasons why I say that it might not be so bad is how it relates to education. So right now in education, you can do whatever you want. If you want to be a musician, bioengineer, computer scientist, nurse, whatever, it's great. But in this kind of future, the problem of climate change and smog in the air and the temperature rising would be that it would unite all of education under a specific goal. So you might see classes like the fundamentals of air filters or carbon capture technology, and it would give people a drive to kind of work towards. Whereas right now, I feel like we don't really have that in education, which is a good thing, but also, you know, it helps to have something to work towards. So that's the first future and how it relates to education. The second future we came up with was a future of company towns. So if you would imagine companies like Microsoft, Google, Apple, even uh, SpaceX with Elon Musk right now is doing something similar to this. They're creating a Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas, where they have plans to create residents around and really make like a city and that might not sound so bad because you get progress, you get efficiency and all that great stuff and it looks very shiny and new, but what you're trading off for that is as a resident, your security. So company towns have existed in the past. Um, and one of the examples that I wanna bring up is uh, there used to be a steel uh, factory and there would be a town surrounding the steel factory. And what would happen was the residents of this town would become in debt to the steel factory because the steel factory owned all these shops and schools and all these things. And they essentially, the residents became prisoners because they couldn't pay off the debt they owed to the company and they weren't making enough at the company to pay off their debt. So they were just kind of stuck. 
Uh, if you guys have seen the movie The Lorax, it's a great contrast uh, or a great comparison. Uh, there's this town that is run by this company, O'Hara, and when the main protagonist starts uh, poking their nose where they shouldn't, O'Hara gets, yeah, the O'Hara gets uh, involved and makes threats and tries to silence the voice to prevent them from realizing what they're missing out of on in the outside world. So how that might relate to education is um, the gov or the company town might provide classes like fundamentals of time management and classes that would help or that would force you to become a complacent worker and not really look outside at the greater picture. So that's our second feature. There's four in total. The third feature is the DNA modification future, uh, like I was talking about before. So imagine a world where you can pay for your child to have baby blue eyes and 20-20 vision and increased IQ and reason and anything you would want, it would create a social hierarchy, kind of a gap where the rich would be able to, you know, create this essentially perfect being. And then the poor who wouldn't be able to afford it would fall into a lower class. And what that does for education is imagine giving your child everything you would need, everything they would need to become a doctor and nothing else. Well, what if that child grows up and yes, they have all the skills needed to become a doctor, but what if they decide to become a, mu a musician? Uh, so what that does is it kind of forces, it takes away the student's freedom and it forces them to walk a very narrow path of what they can and can't do based on social expectation. Another reference to media would be if you guys have seen The Giver, it's a great uh, movie and book. And in that they elaborate on, they would raise these children to be exactly one thing. And once they do that thing, they do that thing for the rest of their life. Thank you, Heather. Um, but yeah, so they would, and essentially at the end of the movie, they realize maybe this isn't the greatest thing. Maybe we should, you know, value our freedom and our independence and all that stuff. So that's the third future. And the fourth and final future is the Wally -E future, another reference. So in Wally, -E, there's a giant galactic cruise ship, I guess, and they have their every single need catered to them. They get their food brought to them. They're always connected online to their friends and family and whatever. And there's really no drive to do anything better in that future. And the reason I bring this future up and relate it to education is because if this future or something similar to this future were to come to fruition, it would, you know, kind of crush our aspirations and the students aspirations. And you might see classes that are lower bar or lower tier classes, like not as like far fetched reaching kind of kind of like basic classes is what I'm trying to say with that. So that would be the fourth feature. And before I pass it on to my coworker, Michaela, I just want to bring it back to why is this so important? And the reason that this that these futures are so important is we're trying to identify what skills we need to learn now in the present day in order to better prepare ourselves for these futures if they come to pass. These are only four of, of hundreds of thousands of different possible futures, but these were the four that we decided to highlight. So with that, I will pass it on to Michaela. Thank you, Patrick. Um, my name is Michaela Paisano. I am a fourth year business student at the University of Windsor, um, and I have been working with Dave on and off for about two years now. Um, so like Patrick was saying, uh, we were given a task and that was to look beyond um, and try to identify fundamental trend lines uh, that can affect either like markets, society or economy in the next 10 to 15 ish years. Um, so these future themes uh, teach us to learn about long term possibilities that we might not be aware of yet, we might not even know they exist yet. Um, so we started off analyzing the shirk challenges um, and then from there, we went a little bit further and we tried to identify um, certain uh, certain possibilities uh, and these included uh, four themes that we came to the conclusion about and that was sustainability science social and systems. Um, Okay, so the first one, the first feature that we're going to touch on is living within Earth's carrying capacity. Um, and this followed the trend of sustainability. So then from sustainability, we broke it down into three different sub themes, and that was environmental, social and economic. Um, so environmental, we have climate solutions. Uh, so whether that be watching our carbon footprint, um, not exploiting natural resources, the maintenance of energy and the resources that we have 
innovation to make a change in our daily lives today that can impact our futures in a positive way. Um, we also have sustainable food. So whether that's the possibility of gravitating towards um, lab grown food or farm to table. Uh, we even hear it a lot now today, recently, you know, going vegan, reducing our meat intake, our dairy intake, and the positive impact that that can have on our environment also. We then have social, oh, sorry, go back one. Uh, we then have social and we have demographics and politics, which kind of go hand in hand. Um, we've seen a lot of it in the last two years, you know, science deniers who are in denial about certain things um, that can happen in our future. So, you know, they, they don't believe that climate change is real, that it's going to have an impact on the future. Um, and it plays a huge part in our lives today. So that's an issue. And then we also have economic. And then in economic, we have inequality. So is it possible that people who are more apt and more specialized um, to take care of our environment or to make an impact our, in our environment in the future, are they going to be put on a pedestal compared to those that are considered average? Um, and this can be you know, scientists or engineers. Um, so inequality is a big possibility. And then also responsibility. Um, so making the necessary changes required today in our daily lives um, in order to benefit us in the future. As we all know, human demands are starting to exceed um, our ecosystems, the capacity of our ecosystems. So, you know, finding, um, finding, taking an initiative, finding that responsibility within ourselves to make that change to benefit us in the future. So next we have, the next year trend we have is envisioning governance systems that work. And, and this followed the trend line of systems. Uh, within systems, we had macroeconomics, financial markets, and politics. So with macroeconomics, we have the digitization of money. Um, so like Patrick was talking about in the future of the company town, um, is it possible that, you know, we get off this path of a traditional currency and we start to, if governments start to make their own um, currency of money, or if the government starts to make their own currency of money that we have to follow. Uh, we also have financial markets, so assets. Is it possible that things aren't going to belong directly to us anymore? Are they going to belong more to the government, to the company, um, the employer that is running the town? And same with risks. Are we going to have that financial freedom to, you know, be able to invest in the stock market, be able to make investments elsewhere? We also have politics, so governments. Are we going to model a company that, or a town that is run by the company, by the employer? Are we going to stray off this traditional government path that we're on right now and that we see today? Um, same with globalization. How is the reference? Sorry, Maddie, I read your comment. Um, with globalization, how is free partner uh, partnerships and um, international trade going to look in the future? Um, the next. The next shirt trend is the emerging a social society, and this followed the trend of society. Uh, so we have future self, future leisure, and future work. Um, and this one specifically, I think we're, we've been seeing a lot in the last two years with the COVID pandemic. Um, so future self, social connection. So if we follow, you know, this one references the Wally world. So if we follow that where you know, everything is online, we're working online, we're going to school online 24 seven, 365. How are we going to maintain that social connection that's so prominent in our lives today? How are we gonna establish that when we are all working remote, we're not seeing each other face to face? Um, so that's an issue. And then privacy, are we gonna have the same freedom that we have today with our technology? Are we gonna be able to use whatever and look at whatever? We also have future leisure, which again, we've seen a huge impact uh, with the pandemic. Um, alternative retail, so already the amount of people going to malls each day has continued to decline since, um, since the COVID pandemic. How many people are now you know, shipping clothes to their front door? Um, so that's a big issue. And then also, you know, in the future, it's possible that you can even start trying on clothes virtually. Um, so again, the mall people going to malls in person is going to keep declining if we keep making these advancements in technology. Um, we also have future work, so employment redefined. Um, employers already today they're they're reconsidering why are we paying for this office space when firsthand we've seen how well our employees can work from home, how much they get done. They're just as productive as they would be if they were in the office. Um, and then remote collaboration. So. If we're not face to face working, how are we going to establish um, that social connection, that collaboration online? 
And then lastly, the last shared trend that we looked at is the evolving bio age. Um, and this followed the trend of science. Uh, within science, we had modern innovation and groundbreaking invention. So with modern innovation, we have virtual services. Again, with the COVID pandemic, we've seen so many, um, whether it's online shopping, online groceries, um, you know, we could even make even more advancements in the future, such as remote healthcare, doctors coming to your door, being able to hop on a Zoom call or a Skype call and have that meeting with your doctor. And um, we also have automation and technology. So whether that's the introduction of nanotechnology, uh, micro machining, different designs, and then we have groundbreaking invention. So biology, um, the, the disruption of notions of what we as humans believe is natural and not natural, and then also new discovery. So beginning to blur the lines of inorganic and organic, um, taking new paradigms, new approaches to science. So we then took it a step further and we began analyzing um, the SHRC challenges and the trends that we just discussed a bit deeper. And we were wondering to ourselves, what qualities or traits do we think is important to be able to possess, um, to be able to not only thrive, but survive in any of these future possibilities? Um, so if we go to the next slide, Patrick. Thank you. Um, these are the most common ones that came up between all four futures that we just discussed. Um, so for example, we have adaptable. So like many of the futures we discussed, you know, we've never seen those situations before. We've never been put in some of those scenarios before. Um, so ourselves being able to adapt to those, to those uncertainties, like Dave was saying, that's gonna be a really important um, characteristic and quality to possess in ourselves. Um, same with problem solve, you know, when we reach a, again, if we reach an uncertain situation that we've never been faced with before, the ability to work through that and get through that. Um, some other ones are optimism, motivation, dedication, independence. Um, next slide. So now we have a question for you all. Um, based on the presentation so far and what you've heard, uh, what skills do you see coming out of these futures? Uh, so if you just want to drop them in the chat room. Empathy is definitely a skill. Critical thinking. Yeah, that's definitely important. Um, I think it's critical thinking is definitely important. I don't know if you agree, Heather, maybe you can elaborate more on this, but, you know, if we're going to be unfaced with so many, un faced with so many uncertainties, trying to think different ways around it and how we can approach these. I don't know if that's what you were thinking, but maybe if you'd like to discuss, further discuss. Yeah, 100%. Just the ability, I guess, to analyze the situation, um, especially the ethical part of it, because when we're talking about the environment, um, yeah. You got it, Michaela. Thank you. Um, Daniel, tinkering, that's very interesting and I've never thought of that one before. Could you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a hard one to, um, to define, but I think tinkering to me is um, looking at different types of systems and figuring out how they break and then figuring out how to fix them in different ways. For sure. Systems thinking, definitely. Like we've talked about the different systems, there are the trends of systems. Okay, so thank you guys for your answer. I'm gonna end it there. Um, and I'm going to pass on the presentation to my coworker, Madeline. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Madeline Poulin. I am a third year mechanical engineering student at the University of Windsor. Um, I've only been working with Dave for four months now, and this is my first time completing a futures activity. So we went through the whole analysis and everything, and we decided that we would end it off with some personal reflections on how, um, on us. So the first thing we decided to do was um, reflect on how these skills, like if we have these skills or if we need to further develop these skills. Um, and where we believe we got these skills. Um, so I'm gonna talk about where I think I got these four skills and I encourage you to think of your own experiences of where you believe you guys got, 
these skills. Um, so these four are the ones that I picked out of um, our mind map. They're the ones that stood out to me that I think are really important to have now and in the future. So when I think about adaptability, uh, the first memory that comes to mind where I was really forced to be adaptable would be my previous work experience at McDonald's. Uh, there was a new franchise opening up and in a new location. So I volunteered to uh, go help open. Um, there was a new layout, new team, new management, a lot of customers. So it was really quick and fast paced and you had to, it was kind of like, had to snap into it. So I guess I really developed the adaptability skill there. And then moving on to independence, I think of the shift between relying on my parents and doing things on my own and becoming independent. Um, so that would be things like moving from my parents controlling my car insurance to now me doing the car insurance or renewing my license, just things that I no longer rely on them for and I can do it by myself. Um, for responsibility, I think of uh, growing up uh, babysitting. I'd babysit my cousins or my neighbors and just watching a little kid, making sure that they ate their food, cleaning up after them, making sure they did their bedtime routine and they were safe for when their parents got home at a young age really made me develop the responsibility that I have now. And then when I think of communications, I think of growing up playing soccer as well. Um, it's a sport that uses a lot of communication for um, like discussing plays, letting them know your position, letting them know you're open, just communicating a lot so that you have the most success within um, the match. Uh, but when I think in, of communication moving forward into the future, I think of more asynchronous communication. So that would be like developing, or, sorry, um, identifying tone, um, interpreting text and knowing your audience. So for communication, I definitely need to develop that one in those aspects since we are, as we are moving forward in the future. So this is just a summary of where I believe I got these skills from. So the bolded and underlined ones are the ones that I just talked about my experiences with and the rest are other um, skills that we came up with during our brainstorm. So a lot of them fall under personal experiences such as work experience, but some of them fall under both post-secondary and personal experience, such as adaptability, how I talked about McDonald's. When I think about adaptability, I also think about um, the shift from going to in-person school to online school during the pandemic. So it kind of fits in the middle there. And then when I think about skills for post-secondary, I think about developing social and collaboration skills from teamwork and group projects and presentations, and also self-motivation for getting your homework done, uh, studying, things like that. But if I were to include other skills that were not a part of our initial brainstorm into post-secondary, I'd include memorization and application, which I believe are two things our school focuses on a lot. Um, so going through this process, we continued reflecting about these skills and the process. and um, how we believe these skills will help us now and in the future. So I believe personally that um, the more skills I have, the more personal growth, sorry if you can hear me background noise, um, the more skills you have, the more <laughs> growth you'll have. Uh, you'll be more comfortable, more confident in both school and in uh, work. It also help you succeed. I feel like if you have more skills, more broad skills, you'll be able to um, approach things differently and just be more success successful with tasks that are presented to you. That being said, you'd be more prepared for those tasks and for unpredictable circumstances, such as the one like the pandemic. You can have uh, more skills for um, coping or dealing with these circumstances. And the final thing that we've talked about a lot during our time here that I think having more skills would help with is approaching uncertainty. Um, this is for both in class and out of class, and it would help you approach these unknowns with an open mindset. So this entire activity was a lot about approaching that idea. Um, we started off this project having no clue of where it was going. Um, the go whole goal was to learn a futures activity and to approach the unknown. Um, 
By the end of it, we were encouraged to develop our own voice about the process and the outcome and what we believe the point of this activity was. So referring to um, approaching uncertainty is what I wanted to focus on. And I was wondering if it's been done before. And I know it's been done before in my previous co-op experiences, um, but I wanted to think about in school if it's been done before. And at first I thought the answer was no, but as I started thinking about it more, I remembered one project in particular that, um, a, that took this uh, approach and it was the analysis of an engine project. Uh, we were not given a rubric or like um, instructions. It was kind of just analyze this engine given the information in class and write a report about it. And at first it was very frustrating because I was nervous about what mark I would get. I had creative freedom and I didn't know um, if I was gonna do good. I didn't know exactly what was wanted. Um, but at the time I didn't realize that there wasn't anything specifically wanted. It was um, what we wanted to do with our project. And it wasn't until I started working here that I made the connection between the pro that project and un approaching uncertainty. Um, that I started appreciating the way my teacher had uh, built that project and it forced us to learn new techniques and try different methods in a classroom instead of just um, here's a rubric or multiple choice where it just uses the knowledge in class. So um, if the skills we prepare ourselves for in the future are specific to our field or in our path, what happens if there's a sudden change um, of trajectory or I have a change of part of what I wanna do in the future? Um, am I put at a disadvantage because I'm not learning as many skills or if I'm just learning specific ones for my field? And when we looked into the future, we found four different futures, but there are infinite number of possible futures and there's no way of knowing which one's gonna come. So we can't just prepare for one future, we have to prepare for all of them. And so that brings me to what I got out of this activity. I think that we should learn both broad and specific skills. And when I say broad, I mean the ones that um, could help us with everyday life, like the ones we talked about earlier and could help us in school, but also specific schools like the memorization and application that we are currently focusing on. But I don't think we should change our teaching style. I think we should incorporate them into the learning process, similarly to what was done in the project that I mentioned earlier, and forcing students to try to new techniques. Um, they may not realize how uh, helpful it is to them now. It might take them till they're starting work, like, it, like how it took me, but I do think it'd be ben beneficial for them. Um, now that's just my perspective on uh, this project that we did. Michaela and Patrick could have different perspectives and you could have a different perspective as well. But this is the first of many open-ended conversations uh, about this topic and similar topics that we're gonna be talking about. And it's important to develop your own opinions and thoughts about the future and the skills and yeah, just everything. So with that being said, I'm gonna pass it back to Dave. That was amazing. Thanks so much, guys. That was really fantastic. I, uh, for those of you who, uh, that's the first time I've heard the whole presentation come together like that. There were new experiences and new stories in there for me. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed their work as well. Um, I'm going to turn off the recording now and then move to q and I, I have a strong feeling about q and A's not actually being recorded. Um, so I'm going to hit stop. We'll post this after, and then we've got room for people to ask questions or comments. Um, Thanks, everybody.